gasoline. It's something we can't do without. Americans use more than 130 billion gallons in a year. Filling up is a routine part of life. But there's nothing routine about how gas gets to you. Just a few weeks before you pump it, the gas that powers your commute may have been deep in the Gulf of Mexico. It's the size of an 83-story office building in the middle of the ocean. And for the hundreds of people who work here, it is a city unto itself. Please join us as we go behind closed doors of the largest working oil platform of its kind, the Hoover Diana. It's a world few people ever see. We were granted exclusive access to ExxonMobil's Hoover Diana to see how they live and work on this high volume oil rig. In a single day, the Hoover Diana is capable of producing enough oil to run two million vehicles for 24 hours. You have to keep your life jackets on at all times, seatbelt on at all times. No it used to be that offshore rigs were inside of shore. But with the Hoover Diana, offshore is way offshore. So my journey began in a helicopter. By boat, it takes 10 hours to get to the Hoover Diana. I thought about how hard a trip that would be in rough seas. For us, it would be an hour and a half flight over the open water of the Gulf of Mexico, about 200 miles from Houston, Texas. And this is truly out in the middle of the ocean. We have not even seen a ship for 45 minutes, but we are now approaching the Hoover Diana. The man in charge here is George Sellers. Thank John, you. welcome to the Hoover Diana. Thank you very much. Glad this to have is you out. exciting to land here. Great. He would introduce me to life on the platform. The first order of business on arrival is a thorough safety briefing. And to account for every person on board, photo IDs are issued. When I first walked around the platform with George, I realized what a huge place this is. The three decks of the Hoover Diana make up four acres, like layers on a cake. It has levels for drilling, production, and support equipment. Most space is reserved for equipment, so the metal stairs connecting the different levels are built on the outside, high over the water. If you have any fear of heights, don't look down. And just why is it called the Hoover Diana? The platform is named for the gas and oil fields it taps. The Hoover oil field is directly below. But the Diana field is 16 miles away. Undersea pipes connect those wells to the Hoover Diana platform. It costs $200,000 a day to run this operation, but that's a drop in the ocean compared to the cost of building it. It's a fairly expensive piece of real estate. It cost us $1.1 billion to put this thing in the water. The returns can be even greater. This one-of-a-kind rig is expected to turn a $9 billion profit during its 20-year lifetime. But the part you see above the ocean is just the tip of the iceberg. You, you took a Coke can or beer can and put some sand in the bottom of it and dropped it in the water, then that's the way it floats. We're doing the same thing. That's right, it floats. And like a ship at sea, it has to have an anchor. Actually, a dozen of them. The Hoover Diana is moored to 12 pilings sunk into the sea floor a half a mile away. To give you an idea of the enormous scale of the project, the Hoover Diana Anchorage covers an area as big as downtown Houston. I was surprised to find out that it moves. Big hydraulic jacks reel in the mooring chains in order to reposition the platform. How much does one of these chain lengths weigh? 408 pounds. Just one chain one length. length. One length. One length. And if you want to move this whole facility over 
there's a drill hole, you do that by adjusting these on one side and the other, right? That's correct. If we wanted to move east-west, we'd all simply let out on the east side, pull in on the west side, and we would move the whole assembly to the west. Building this incredible machine was a massive undertaking. Hoover Diana is the world's deepest drilling and production platform. No one had ever done it at this water depth. This is the largest in the world, so we had to develop the technology associated with how to moor it, and how to install it, and how to drill the wells. The caisson, the 700-foot can-like hull that goes underwater, was fabricated in Finland, then assembled in Corpus Christi, Texas. It took two days to tow it to the site. In the pre-dawn darkness of November 99, the hull was upended in the Gulf of Mexico. The water shooting up in the air as it uprighted it looks fairly small, but it actually was a 200-foot water column as it uprighted. Nearly everything about the Hoover Diana project set records. When the platforms moved out, they had to shut down the Houston shipping channel for a day. It took two cranes on the largest heavy lift vessel in the world to ease the platforms into place. That's the nuts and bolts of this big rig, but it takes human beings to make it work. How many people work on the Hoover Diana? Right now we've got about 120 people working on board. We've had as many as 250 plus when we were doing construction. This is also a drip uh, pan that stops any fluid. To make this floating job site a home, you've got to have a place to hang your hard hat. This is the living quarters. Let me catch that fire door That's for you because it's rather heavy. Wow. And it's uh, strictly for fire use to stop any fires. The living quarters for the ExxonMobil crew are on the top deck, tucked underneath the helicopter pad. All right, so in here, our offices and offices, change rooms, bedrooms. Bedrooms. This is a sick bay. We have a medic on board 24 hours a day. I'm told that for an oil platform, yeah. it's pretty luxurious. Even though space is tight, every room has its own bath and TV. Have some pretty nice quarters on this particular platform, real nice. Uh, we generally sleep two to four people to a room. Our clothes are washed for us by our catering team at night. It's a good life. This may be the most important room on the Hoover Diana. Aha, the galley. That's the area we're uh, entering now, the galley, where we have our meals each day, we take our breaks, the hands With come in. With a great view. We have a beautiful view. Very few places have the view that we have. And the food's good? The food is excellent. <laughs> food out here in our caterers, that's a morale factor for the people. If you get a bad cook, you can't stay long, because uh, I hear it from everybody, this is not going to work. How often do you get food? We get food once a week. We get it every Saturday, and whenever we get container, our grocery cart is full. We get containers out here, and it usually takes them 20 to 30 people to unload them and get the food put away. Groceries arrive on a supply boat, but you have to ask, how do people get on and off to help unload? There's not an elevator to be found, unless you count this. Right. This is the only elevator we have on this big building. So this is the only building. elevator, huh? Right. The crane operator gave me a lift in the personnel basket. There's no seat belt or harness on this ride. Just put on a life vest and hang on. <laughs> From 20 stories above the water, I got a great view of the Gulf of Mexico and some of the fish that visit the waters around the rig. As tempting as it looks, there's no swimming and no fishing. Are those tuna? Yes. So it's yellow-tail tuna. Yes, it is, Joe. I've had that before. <laughs> Coming up, the secret to how they discover oil deep under the gulf. 8,000 feet. feet down. And I try my hand at drilling for oil. I can't ruin it, can I? Behind closed doors will continue in a moment here on a and &E. Nice bowl, though. Campbell Select. Mm-mm, good. Behind Closed Doors with Joan London continues here on a and &E. The oil production rig Hoover Diana is a self-sufficient island 160 miles offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. Every new well is a $50 million gamble. So like in real estate, the three most important things in the oil business are location, location, location. 
Years ago, if one out of 15 wells was a gusher, that was a good average. Now, using high-tech eyes and ears, two out of four wells will be a home run. Knowing where to drill is up to a new breed of oil prospector here at the Exxon Mobil Research Center in Houston, Texas. Evaluating potential oil fields beneath the ocean floor used to be a painstakingly drawn-out process, but today, behind these closed doors, geologists use the latest in technology to accomplish in days what used to take years. This is the Seismic Imaging Lab. It looks like a multi-million dollar screening room, but the only features shown here are about what lies beneath the ocean floor. Like bats use sonar to see in the dark, scientists use seismic imaging to see underground. It's every bit as high tech as the space industry. They deal with outer space, we really deal with inner space. Bill Drennan, who heads up the Seismic Research Division, showed me how it all works. Sound waves are bounced deep into the earth. We could stack telephone books 300 miles high. That's how much data is collected. Supercomputers crunch the numbers for up to several months to turn the data into pictures. The result is like seeing the Hoover Field with X-ray vision. So this is like 8,000 feet down below... 8,000 feet, feet down. Below the mud line. The red areas show where the oil is. Many of us have the idea that oil sits underground in a pool. It actually hides in what looks like solid sandstone. So the oil is inside the of here. The oil is actually in there. That's what's giving that sand its brown color. In a microscopic view, the individual grains of sand would be like the marbles in this beaker. And like this liquid, oil fills all the space in between. Beaker. So that's where the oil is. That's where the oil is. And that's where they put the Hoover Diana, above the oil. All the people on this rig are here for one reason, to get oil and gas out of the Gulf. Each day starts at 5 a.m. with breakfast and a mandatory meeting at 6. Safety is always on the agenda. Inch by inch, safety's a cinch, you know. <laughs> They have to wake up at 5, be here at 6 for the safety meeting, and then they work until 6 at night. They work until 6.30. They don't get paid for their 30 minutes off for lunch. <laughs> oh. During a typical day, the ExxonMobil crew will maintain equipment, monitor production, and keep every inch of the facility clean. One thing they won't do is battle traffic. Your commute's very short. It's about uh, less than 100 yards from my bedroom to the galley to my job. So 12 hours a day is not really hard. It's not like working eight hours a day in town, and I don't bite any traffic. Because the job site is 160 miles at sea, most of the crew works 7-7. That's seven days on, seven days off. While that might seem strange for most nine to fivers, it's a way of life for the offshore crews. Been out here 25 years, I know nothing else. Working seven on, seven off, it's what my family's used to, it's what I'm used to. I don't believe I could ever go back to a five and two job. I get a vacation twice a month. I get a one week vacation every other week. But you, you gotta love it in order to... Yeah, you gotta like it to do it. What do you like best about it? I like the money more than anything. <laughs> the money? <laughs> yes. While the money's good, platform workers can make six figures, the lifestyle takes a toll on everyone. The time away from your family when they call and say the vehicle's broken down or the sink is clogged up and or the kids are misbehaving and you have to deal with that from out here. Now we're up on the pony deck. What keeps them out here is the search for oil. Drilling superintendent Mark Moyer took me high up to the part of the platform where the drilling begins. How far have you gone into the earth? About 200 feet. And how far will you go into the earth? We'll go about 10,000 feet into the earth. 10,000 feet? Wow. The drill rig is under the 180-foot tower that sits on top of the oil platform, six stories up from the production deck. Which is the next deck here? This is the drill floor. This is where all the action happens. This is the rig floor. These men that are working here in the gray uniforms are called roughnecks. 
the Roughnecks work for a subcontractor that specializes in drilling wells. I was impressed with how easily they handled the tons of drill pipe. Far below us, the drill bit was digging a new hole. There are many different kinds of drilling bits and different sizes. This is a 24-inch, what we call a tricone roller cone bit. It actually crushes the rock, break it into little pieces, then the drilling fluids carry those pieces out of the well, and that's how we drill the well. The drilling is run from a small booth just a few feet from the spinning pipe. Joan, this is called the driller's doghouse. This is our driller, Smooth. Hi, Smooth. Uh, Smooth showed me what only experienced drillers know how to do. The red lever controls a brake that holds the weight of the pipe. Let go of the brake, and the weight of the pipe pushes down on the bit. This gauge shows him how much pressure he's applying to the drill bit. You like that? Okay. I can't ruin anything, can I? No. All right. It's a delicate balancing act. Not enough pressure and the bit goes nowhere. Too much and the pipes could buckle or even snap. It was almost hard to comprehend. Just lifting the brake lever controlled a mile of pipe that stretched from where I stood on the rig all the way to the floor of the ocean and then 200 feet below. Now you go fine, as long as you're not stacking weight. The problem is, drilling on the ocean floor is a lot like a mission to Mars. You can't be there to see what you're doing. The solution is on the other side of the platform. Behind this closed door is the control room for the Magnum ROV. It's a 4,000-pound remote-operated vehicle. Like an unmanned submarine, the ROV hovers just above the seabed. 4,800 feet down, the pressure at that depth would crush a person. An example is a coffee cup. Yeah. A styrofoam coffee cup. Everyone's familiar with this. Right. After it's come back from a trip to the seafloor, uh -huh. we end up with this. Squishes it down to this? Yes, it does. With just the twist of a joystick, I drove the ROV a mile below. Now I could see the other end of the pipe I controlled from the drilling rig. It makes you feel like part Neil Armstrong, part Jacques Cousteau. This truly is like having incredible dexterity, almost like having a diver down there. This is for the generation of kids that grew up with video games. It may feel like a game, but it's not. This multi-million dollar piece of equipment is the only way they can keep an eye on their billion dollar underwater investment. What I did for a short while the crews on the Hoover Diana do all day and all night. The lights never go out on the platform. But it's not all work and no play. After work, there are calories to burn off, free phone calls to make, and video games to play. Security concerns prevent internet access. There's always plenty of food, but never any alcohol. You don't have to need beer and alcohol to have a good time. It's our offshore family, so we have a good time together. They might not have all the comforts of home, but the Gulf of Mexico makes a spectacular backyard. You got the front row seat out we here, have. I'll tell you. We have. Next, facing the oil platform's ultimate disaster. All personnel muster at lifeboats and fighting fire with a life-saving wall of water. Behind Closed Doors will continue in a moment here on A... Behind Closed Doors with Joan London continues here on a and &E. In the oil business, when everything works, we don't even know they exist. But when something goes wrong, the whole world hears about it. For many people, pictures of the Exxon Valdez disaster are the lasting image of big oil. The accident spilled 11 million gallons of crude oil, polluting about 1,500 miles of Alaska's coastline. 
Because of high-profile accidents like the Exxon Valdez and smaller spills around the world, oil workers live under a microscope. On the Hoover Diana, they claim that if even a single drop goes into the Gulf, it's reported. All of our people are trained to do that. If any one of them sees anything hit the water, it's reported and it's passed on to our governmental agencies that we messed up. Here's a drop of oil in the Gulf. The deadliest accidents aren't about spills, but flames. Thick smoke still billowed from the burning platform. July 6, 1988, Occidental Petroleum's platform Piper Alpha in the North Sea was consumed by fire. 167 people died, and a billion dollar platform was destroyed. It was the worst ever offshore accident. The biggest threat for workers on any oil platform is fire. And here on the Hoover Diana, they take that threat very seriously. Besides having 1,500 safety systems on board, the entire crew is prepared to battle flames. All of our people are fire trained. They go to U.S. Coast Guard fire training where we actually have to fight live fires. So they're not afraid of fires. They respect them, but they also understand what they can do with a fire. To knock down a blaze, the Hoover Diana has a system similar to the fire sprinklers you'd see in an office building. But using the word sprinkle here would be an understatement. It delivers so much water that they call it the deluge system. If anything happens, it's to cool it enough that if there's any personnel in here, they can get out of this uh, center well. The deluge is focused on the wellheads, where the highly flammable oil and gas come into the platform. Wow! Just standing on the sidelines, I was nearly drenched with the salty seawater. So but even this torrential downpour might not be enough if flames were engulfing the rig. If they had to abandon the platform, here's how they'd do it. This is an emergency response drill. All personnel muster at lifeboat. When the siren goes off, the crew heads to what's called their muster station. And the rule is to walk. Running is not allowed on the platform. Everyone puts on life jackets. And here's why those ID cards are so important. Before boarding the lifeboats, you turn your card over. So at a glance, officers can tell if anyone on the crew is missing. life boats are really self-contained capsules that would protect the crew even if the ocean is covered in flames. They have their own oxygen system and they also have a spray and water system that spray water over them to keep them cool and their main purpose in life is just to get people away from the platform. We do keep them manned with food and water for up to seven days for the people aboard. And like a ship at sea, the crew also has to be prepared if someone yells, man overboard. A fast rescue boat is always on standby, ready to be launched as someone falls off the platform or a supply boat. It's a quick ride down. It wouldn't take very long. It takes us about 15 seconds just to get to the water. From then on, we're, we're right on it. For this drill, the victim is just a mannequin, but the crew handles it as though it was a fellow crew member. Everything I saw on the Hoover Diana, from the safety drills, to the deep diving ROV, to the driller's doghouse, was a real eye-opener. And more than I ever expected, more complex, more livable, more fascinating. Once the last of the wells are drilled, the big oil derrick will be removed, and the Hoover Diana platform will be a production operation staffed by a crew of about 40 people, hard at work for the next 20 years. Yeah, if you're back in this area, just drop in on us. Yeah. You're welcome anytime. <laughs> you got your little ID card Absolutely, now. Absolutely, so I can drop yeah. in anytime. And you know what? I just might take George up on that invitation.
gasoline. It's something we can't do without. Americans use more than 130 billion gallons in a year. Filling up is a routine part of life. But there's nothing routine about how gas gets to you. Just a few weeks before you pump it, the gas that powers your commute may have been deep in the Gulf of Mexico. It's the size of an 83-story office building in the middle of the ocean. And for the hundreds of people... The three decks of the Hoover Diana make up four acres. Like layers on a cake, it has levels for drilling, production, and support equipment. Most space is reserved for equipment, so the metal stairs connecting the different levels are built on the outside, high over the water. If you have any fear of heights, don't look down. And just why is it called the Hoover Diana? The platform is named for the gas and oil fields it taps. The Hoover oil field is directly below. But the Diana field is 16 miles away. Undersea pipes connect. People who work here, it is a city unto itself. Please join us as we go behind closed doors of the largest working oil platform of its kind, the Hoover Diana. It's a world few people ever see. We were granted exclusive access to ExxonMobil's Hoover Diana to see how they live and work on this high volume oil rig. In a single day, the Hoover Diana is capable of producing enough oil to run two million vehicles for 24 hours. You have to keep your white jackets on at all times, seatbelt on at all times. No it used to be that offshore rigs were inside of shore. But with the Hoover Diana, offshore is way offshore. So my journey began in a helicopter. By boat, it takes 10 hours to get to the Hoover Diana. I thought about how hard a trip that would be in rough seas. For us, it would be an hour and a half flight over the open water of the Gulf of Mexico, about 200 miles from Houston, Texas. And this is truly out in the middle of the ocean. We have not even seen a ship for 45 minutes, but we are now approaching the Hoover Diana. The man in charge here is George Sellers. Thank Joan, you. welcome to the Hoover Diana. Thank you very much. Glad this to have is you exciting out. to land here. Great. He would introduce me to life on the platform. The first order of business on arrival is a thorough safety briefing. And to account for every person on board, photo IDs are issued. When I first walked around the platform with George, I realized what a huge place this is. 